Hello, and welcome to the BYU Family History Library webinar series. We're glad you could join us today. I'm Anna Allred, and I'll be your host for this webinar. If you have technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box and I can address your concerns. You are welcome to use the chat box during the webinar for comments, insights, and questions. However, all questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Our next webinar is on um, November 17th, Irish Family History Research, The Essentials with Maureen Brady. If you would like to access a previous webinar, please visit our webinar index on our website or search on our YouTube channel. All of our webinars are recorded and uploaded by the following Monday for your convenience. We also post links to our recordings and other updates on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. For today's webinar, we are pleased to hear from James Baker, who will be giving a presentation on Watch Out for the Six Dangerous DNA Myths Part 2. Um, and then, Mr. Baker has been an active genealogist for the past 15 years. In 2011, he completed the Board for Certification of Genealogist Requirements to become a board certified genealogist with a specialty in German genealogy research. He also specializes in Midwest US, early American research and DNA. He was an officer of the Sacramento Gen German Genealog Genealogy Society and contributed numerous articles to its quarterly publication, Der Boom and Bomb. He also wrote articles for the National Genealogical Society magazine and the NGS Quarterly. He volunteered for over 10 years at the Sacramento Regional Family History Library. He has presented a total of nine webinars for Legacy Family Tree and for the Southern California Genealogy Jamboree communities. Beginning in 2012, he has given over 400 presentations to over 50 genealogy societies at local, regional, and national genealogy events. Mr. Baker earned a PhD in sociology and social psychology from the University of Utah. He is retired from an aerospace and business management career. In his work career, he consulted for many large companies, including Boeing, General Electric, Lockheed Martin, and Raytheon. He has been an adjunct professor of sociology at UCLA and USC. His most fun job was being the piano man at Shakey's Pizza Parlor. And James, if you're ready, we'll turn the time over to you. I think I'm ready. Shall I push a button or two? Yep. Share screen. And then I'll say, I want to continue. And let's see there, I've got, I've got something to double click on. And now we'll say slideshow from the beginning. And, and I think I'm ready for action. So, so welcome to everyone. And today we're going to talk about some more of those dangerous the, the dangerous DNA myths. And I really only talk about the autosomal ones. There might be some for the other parts of things, but we've got enough here to worry about with, uh, with the autosomal. Just to begin with, and much as I did last time for part one, we want to make this point that that myths are kind of bad because it makes us waste our time. We get off on the wrong foot and we will not be able, if we believe those myths, we won't be able to make the most of our DNA opportunities because there are really good opportunities. And I think a lot of us are missing some of them because we have bought in to some of these really bad myths. And Let's see, I told you this last time, but I know there might be some new people. And so, uh, uh, so I'll just briefly talk about uh, just some examples of some, some bad genealogy myths in general. One has to do with the, with the fact that you, you've heard it of how people came to this country and and the, those bad people at Ellis Island changed their family name and that made it kind of confusing for us. Well, it was, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. And uh, here's another bad myth that says, 
you don't need to look at anything uh, except what's online because everything is online. Well, when we begin looking at some of the facts, we find it was not the bad guys at Ellis Island. They knew what they were doing. They could speak the foreign languages. They had been hired as new immigrants. And in point of fact, the immigrants' names were actually written down in the original ship manifest where the ship departed. And so that's where we get their names. And just as a sideline note, the one time mayor of New York had once worked there and so did a lot of other people who had come from those countries and who spoke those languages. Now, talking about what church, what records are not online, and there's a lot of them. Um, all of my, when doing my German genealogy, those foreign church records, they were not online. The old newspapers, they're mostly not online. And the government's very slow putting things online. Now, here's what we want to really get away from, and that is DNA is not probably going to help you very much. It's just a novelty. Not so. Some people who, who are expecting the DNA company to do all of their work for them, they're disappointed and they say, maybe I've wasted my money. Not true, but you might have to do a little bit of work on it yourself. Now, here is, uh, here's, a, here's my list. And the ones that say part one, we've already talked about those. The second one down we're going to talk about today, and that is about the DNA results beyond the third and fourth generation. Will that do you any good? And that's the question. And then the next one, when we talk about really low DNA scores, one myth is, and it is a myth, it's the, that the low scores, they, they're not, they're not going to help you much. And so like if the score is only 10 or 12 or eight, forget it. Well, do not forget those because, and today I'm going to try to make believers out of you that low scores can also be good. All right, here's the first of those. We are up to myth number five. And this is the one that says, DNA doesn't help beyond about the fourth generation. And yet that's the place we're most likely to need that help because that's where we're going we're gonna to have gaps in our family trees. That's where we're missing data or the data might be questionable. And so that's, uh, that's what we want to think about. There are some related potential problems with finding people out there who are further out. And so the, the companies themselves make it more difficult. Ancestry, because it's a conservative operation and they don't want to promise you that you're really a match with people unless they can really pin it down. <clears throat> They give you less information about the low and low scored people. Now they're they're pretty good with the upper group that they label these are our first all the way to fourth cousins, but when we get down to scores below twenty, that it says these people, they're out there the fifth maybe they're seventh or eighth cousins, and the the implication is. It's a lot more nebulous. It's murkier out there. It's harder to do business with. Ancestry only gives you through line data up to the fifth cousin level. Now, they don't even want to really think about sixth or seventh cousins, but they could. Now, here's another discouraging thought, and that is 
the, these big companies, they all have their charts that say, this is what this kind of a score means. You get something in the high 800s, that's probably your first cousin. You get something around the 200s, now you're down to a second cousin. Well, marked in red there, if you've got a fifth cousin, on average, this is what the big guys say in DNA, on average, a fifth cousin's only going to score about 3.5. And remember the cutoff is eight. So most of those people who are your potential fifth cousins don't make the cutoff and you will never even find them among your matches. And so we say, how could we ever find a fifth cousin, let alone a sixth or a seventh? Not to worry, we're going to turn this around. And one way we turn it around is simply through good luck. And we are going to occasionally have some good luck in finding some of those DNA people, our DNA matches, some of whom will score high enough, and yet there'll be fifth or sixth or seventh cousins. The thing is, even though they're the average for all of your fifth cousins is only maybe going to be 3.5, for each kind of a relationship, even like a fifth cousin, there is a range of scores. Some people, it's kind of like the bell curve, except it's a different kind of a curve. But that kind of a curve says, yeah, there's some people who average or hit near the average, but there's some others who score much higher than the average. Some will also score lower than the average. Second bullet, in fact, about 10 or 15% of our matches get a lot more than their share of of expected average DNA from certain ancestors. And so that makes them high scorers for that particular connection. And so many of our fifth, sixth, seventh cousins score higher than we might expect that they're going to score. And so they get listed among our matches because they scored high enough to make the cut. Now, at the other extreme, be aware that there will be another 10%, 15% of the people who score much lower than they should. Well, all we can do is think about those people. But like if there's, a, say, we're looking at fourth cousins, and an average score is considered about 14, so some of them will score a lot lower than that. And well, it'll be more than 50% that should show up, but maybe 20, 30% of them will not show up. But forget those people, we're looking at the good ones who scored high, high, at least high enough to make the cut. Now, here's the reality of the ancestry scores. They group them into two big, really big buckets. The ones who score over 20, they call them first to fourth cousins, and most of them, most of them are. And then the ones that they they lump into the group that they score score uh, below 20, and those are the fifth down to the eighth cousins. Now, right about now, I've got about 1,500 matches that are above the line. Uh, and that means they scored more than 20. I've got a lot, a lot more, you know, like 95% of them scored below the line. Now, some of the matches that, that are below 20 are really low scoring, second, third, fourth cousins. Some of the ones who score above 20 will actually be fifth or sixth, that kind of cousin. So, some, of, some people are scoring a little higher than they should, some a little lower. And to analyze things 
correctly, we have to consider both of those situations. <clears throat> Blaine Bettinger, you probably know of because he's sort of Mr. Genetic uh, DNA genealogy. He writes, he blogs, he gives classes, he does it all. In a year and a half or so ago, in, in 2020, he updated his research on, he's got a project going where he has people contribute data. And so he has now contributed and people have contributed and he's processed that data for like 60,000 people. One thing that consistently surprises me is that those people, Bettinger's data shows that they do a lot, have a lot of data for, uh, uh, for the lower scorers. Look where that right-hand blue arrow is. And you'll see that in those last two right-hand columns, we're talking here about third cousins, fourth cousins, sixth, seventh. He has found them all the way to eighth cousins. Here's kind of a blow up of, of the key data there from that right hand side. If you look across the top, you see um, in that uh, the number column tells how many people he found with his different contributors who are all these different categories of relationships, fourth, fifth, fifth, sixth cousins. People have found a lot of those folks. And indeed, my own small microcosm of this kind of information, I'm finding the same thing. Now for Bettinger's people, he also showed an average score for each category. Now notice that those averages are the real averages. The right-hand column would be the expected number. That's why, like for down there for the fifth cousin, he shows 3.3. Now, that would be if we considered all of the ones who were there, but we're not. We're only considering the ones who scored higher than they should have, perhaps, and that's a very different group. Now, I have some examples from my own data. This is my own through line data. And so here's one of my, uh, let's see, it says he's a fourth great grandfather. Well, on the left side, see that blue arrow, that's where he is. And Ancestry has found 164 matches that I have with this guy who is that far back. And look, he lived 1728. He was in the Revolutionary War. I mean, this is a long time ago. And so if people match me with him, he's six generations back. And so these are my fifth cousins. And, but they have found those people and, uh, and, uh, and indeed not only with that guy, Ilgen Fritz, I've found a lot of common ancestors through that through lines, but here's just some examples of some other places where I have successes with fifth cousins. And remember, in order to be in the club, you had to post some data. And I'm sure that I had just as many people who are in that same category among the people who didn't post their data. So, so really I have a lot of good sixth generation people out there. One of my families on my mother's side, the Tracy family is very well documented. They came very early to America. They came to Connecticut in the 1600s. The original man, Lieutenant Thomas, came there very early. He had a large family. His children all had large families. And so early genealogists wrote books where they compiled all this data 
And a lot of other New England families did the same thing. So back there in early Connecticut, early New England, I have all kinds of data that's fairly well vetted, a good sized, a real thick family tree. Well, over the years, and with also with DNA, I have accumulated enough data to link my group that I had back four or five generations. I connected it up with that early group. And so I really have a very well-documented family. Here's a picture of my family tree with the Tracy's. Uh, Tracy's are going right up from my mother. See so you. Uh, straight up, which where the arrow is, that that's a Tracy who's about one, two, three, four, six generations back, and I go back further than that, and I have a lot of good information on those Tracys. Now, going back that uh, just a few generations, I had good success with some of those Tracy people, and then. Second bullet, because of those really good New England records, I found uh, a lot of Tracy family matches uh, DNA, and I could find them because they also posted their trees and they had good scores and they connected with the early people. And so I had posted my nice Tracy tree and so Ancestry was able to help me with through lines. And before they had through lines, they used to have DNA circles. And that was also a winner. They helped me with good things there. They called those green leaf matches. And But a couple of years ago, Ancestry traded in their, what they called shared ancestor hints. They, and they traded in DNA circles with through lines. And through lines is really a good feature. It's my, maybe the best feature they've got. But two years ago, Ancestry had not been quite so conservative thinking about those seventh and eighth generation people. So let me give you some examples. This is from two years ago when they had their uh, green leaf people. And so here I am on the left. See, I'm, I, I go up however many, uh, I think it's seven generations to go to Christopher Tracy. And then also you see on the right hand side, here's a guy who has posted his tree. <clears throat> he goes up by a different route, but he gets there. Ancestry says, this is your seventh cousin. Here's another one. They say, this is your seventh cousin once removed. And they've, they've got another one. <clears throat> well, I see this one's going even back one generation further. And so they're going back to a man who's born really far back, 16 something. And notice that they, they say, this man is your uh, eighth cousin. So they did that as of two years ago, but then they've, they've, grown, they've, they've gone more conservative and they have chosen to not go out any further than fifth cousins. And so it doesn't mean that those seventh and eighth cousin connections were not valid. It just simply means that uh, they've, they've gone more conservative. Now, actually, I had looked at those seventh and eighth cousins. <clears throat> they had modest low scores but they had, they had their tree postings that looked good. And they also, some of them had shared matches with some other people that strengthened that case. And those other people were also known to me as other good Tracy matches. Now, remember I showed you the Bettinger chart 
and it showed that some of his people, some of his contributors had reported scores as high as 57 for a seventh cousin. Now that's unusual, uh, but it can happen. Now, in my case, one of the seventh cousins hit the, a score of 32 and some others in the 20s, but mostly those scores are lower scores. <clears throat> now, I'm gonna introduce you to a, a special tool that does not exist anymore, but it did for a while. And, and I, so even though you cannot use it, it's going to give you some insights. And so we're going to talk about a man named Jonathan Brecker, who a couple of years ago created a third party tool where you could download data from Ancestry and then his his software would massage that data and define certain clusters of matching people. Now, the wonderful thing that it did was that it identified a lot of low scoring matches who they themselves had a lot of shared matches. And so now I can see those low scorers and I can kind of link, link them all up. Well, here's, uh, here's one of those pictures that I'll show you. This is what the Brecker thing did. It shows the, you see the names of the people on both the X and the Y axis. And then you can see, did they match one another? And you get this great big shock of data there showing, yes, all these people are matching one another. And the beauty of it is, that you did not have to post your data to be in this group because he's just looking for data of people who match one another. And here's a group of people who all kind of cluster. This continues on. These all are early people. That is, they're matching early Tracy people. These are like my sixth and seventh cousins. Now, this time, uh, let's see, I should show you on the left, there are, uh, see the, uh, the blue group where it's, it just says, you, we're gonna link something up there, but the next column are the scores. And so we see 28, 24, 24, and so on. Now, we're going to add in this time a lot of low scoring matches, but see many of these people with scores of, look at the numbers on the left, 12, 11, 14, 17, and so on. On the right-hand side, you can see they're matching some of those same people. A lot of them are matching, which even adds more people to that cluster. Well, I originally had something like uh, oh, 100 or so people in that cluster, but here Brecker has found a lot of others and a lot of them scored below 10, but they are still good solid people. How are they related to me? They're part of that super huge cluster of similar people. They've got good scores, even though they're small scores, and they have good trees, many of them. And sometimes their trees show that they indeed are six or seven cousins. Now, why do I believe that they're six or seven cousins? Well, they're showing a tree, and also they have shared matches with other people in that same group. So this kind of evidence really makes the case that you can identify matches that go back six, seven, eight generations. But as I told you, the, the Brecker tool is not available. Ancestry got mad, I think. I think he, he was using up too much of their, of their time or something like that. But anyway, we don't have that tool anymore 
but but nevertheless you can still find a lot of low scoring matches that have a lot of connections a lot of shared matches with you and with the other people in those different groups that are identified as a different cluster now that was the tracy cluster i have another example here and I'll, i'm calling this after my earliest uh, it used to be my earliest owen ancestor she's a person who got married into the tracy's her father is named Epinetus, and I'm, I'm, he's solid because of a combination of DNA data and also a paper trail. And then I have data for Epinetus's wife. And so now these people are going to be sixth or seventh cousins. See where the blue arrow is. This time I'm way out there seven generations with with spencer and with uh, and with the owen group and so now i want to i want more data though so i'm going to start with the data that we have these are owen people and they are fifth cousins so we're going to look at my data and this time i've got a couple more people to look at and these are some of my second and third cousins, but they're also connected with me on the Owen side. So that's what we're going to do is look at this, this type of data. So first of all, I had fairly good paper trail evidence for the Owen family. And then with through lines, I found 15 matches at the fifth cousin level. Ancestry helped me with that. And, but then I, my friend Jim allows me to look at his data. He's my third cousin. He has Owen family connections too. And he has different Owen family connections. And remember I told you, that some people score higher than they should. They get more DNA from a particular family group. So he's getting some with different people and I have some. And then I've got this cousin Deb and she's also connected with the Owen group. So I'm looking at her data and yeah, she has through line data also. So between all of us, we're finding people who go back in time, way back there into the early Owen group. Now, I told you about that Brecker tool that they, he pulls out all of your data, all of your, in my case, 26,000 matches, and, and he's going to find the ones who match with other people, even though they might have low scores. And so for starters, I only had a few people who matched 15, but now I'm going to see if I can find more that Brecker has found. Now see here, here's my first group. And I've got about, about eight matches over there on the right. You can see the ones who are matching each other. The same name is on the left-hand axis the x-axis and the y-axis. And so they've kind of color coded it so that you can see down there where the arrow is, those are some people. Uh, I've, I've drawn a small arrow to Ron Owen. And then there's a couple Spencers that are also connected to the Owen family. So they're, they're beginning to show a small cluster of people. Well, now this time we're adding in the lower scores. And so down below, you can see where the three arrows are on the left. We're now going to add in some people who also have connections to that Owen group and the Spencer group. 
and it gives us a lot more information, a lot more, um, a lot more evidence here that it looks like we indeed have really found something useful. Now, Brecker would have made it easier for us, but we can really kind of do the same analysis using the capabilities that Ancestry has. And so what we would have done, we start with the people that we know and then go from there to their shared matches. We build a cluster and see in this case, I have a cluster of you know, several of these good Owen people. Ancestry gave us another tool where they gave us the longest segment information. And that's kind of helpful because even though they don't tell us which chromosome it's on, we can kind of at least get the idea that all of these Owen people, or in this case, the Spencer people, were connecting on the same chromosome. And just to, to collect more information, more evidence with, with the Brecker thing, I found about 30 more matches. And the more you find, the better off you are. Now, we don't have Brecker, so second bullet, we might still get the same information if we clicked on the surname selection option like in this case, if I would look for anybody with the name Owen in their family, and I might have supplemented that with the geographic option because I know what part of the country they're from. So when I do that, I can pick up some other people. And, and so it works not as well as with Brecker, but it still works. And so here I am showing different people who are connected with that Owen family. Now, of course, well, and here I'm, I'm just supplementing this by showing the same data that I got from my cousin who also has Owen connections. And so once again, I've got matches with these people. So does my, my cousin, Jim Fetter, and he's got in fact, he's got more matches with them than I do for whatever reason. And it's just the luck of the draw. So here's the kind of results that we got. And we found a lot of good data by now between those people who let me look at their data, my, my cousins and me. So we identified among ourselves several different Owen family people. And so we're solid with them at the fifth cousin level. Incidentally, a lot of these people have low scores. Their, their scores, a lot of them are like 12 and 14 and 11 and such. And so th that's kind of where we are with that. But we found a good number of them and even though some of those people did not post good trees because they had enough shared matches, it works okay. Now, here's our story that we went through, and I hope I didn't beat it into the ground too much, but I, I really wanted to make the point, and here's the fact, that within your match list of people, Certainly the greatest proportion of them, well over 90% are people scoring lower than 20. And those are the people that are going to be, by and large, your fifth cousins. The through line feature will identify a lot of them. And remember, Breck, uh, Bettinger sees nothing unusual about this. A lot of his people found a lot of fifth and sixth and seventh cousins. And so this is our story that by analyzing the posted trees of our people, we look at their shared matches, we can find people who are way out there. Now we advance to our final myth number six, 
that says low Centimorgan scores are useless. You've heard it, I've heard it. Some people say, oh, he only got a score of 12, 15. He's, if it's below 20, forget it. We do not forget it. In fact, we have just learned that most of the scores of our fifth and sixth cousins are below 20. Ancestry has set that point at 20 where they sort of suggest these, this is really good information. These are the first to fourth cousins. And then I think the implication is if the scores get lower, maybe you're not that interested. Well, there's ancestry also makes it harder to work with the low scoring people. Even to access them, you've got to scroll and scroll down to get to them. And there are so many of them. And so that, that becomes a problem. And, and then here, here's something else. Second bullet. Ancestry is excellent in identifying all the shared matches for any, any of the matches, as long as those shared matches, the other ones also have scores over 20. But Ancestry does not include matches that score below 20 in its shared match listing. And so they're kind of making like a, as if that's, uh, that's the magic number, but it's not. That is just a super com conservative number. When you go to a really low scoring match under 20, you can click to find out if they have shared matches. But again, they're only going to show you the ones that they had um, a shared match score of at least 20. And so that's being really super conservative. Here is, I think, really a useful graphic. And that is that Ancestry only gives us complete data on about 5% of our people, namely the ones who score over 20. For the ones below 20, we've got to work harder to find those matches who have shared matches because they don't do it automatically. And so, you know, you kind of think, well, that means those lower scoring matches are lemons. They are not. We have a way to make them into lemonade. So what is the chief value? It's not if you're looking for a first or a second or third. It's when you're getting down there looking for a fourth or fifth, and that's probably where we need to help. And that's where the lower scores are going to help us the most. So I've kind of put a chart in here to show what is more typical for the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh. This is this kind of similar to the one, uh, uh, the Bettinger chart, but like on average for a fourth cousin, if it's uh, if for everybody it's a 14, the, the ones that are actual, because some of them are going to drop off the lower end, that number will be higher than that. And so we're going to find a number of people who score 30 and 25 and, and the rest of it, and they are maybe fifth or seventh cousins. So now, how to find those low scoring people. First of all, remember through lines, through lines, for me, they found 600 people who had posted enough data that Ancestry could say, yes, you've got a match here. And that person scored under 20. And indeed, in many cases, those were like fifth and sixth cousins. Second bullet, we can also find some low scores by putting in, by using the surname option or maybe the geographic option. And maybe there are occasional third party tools. 
Now here's an example of low scores. And this is a little research I did on my Elifritz family two or three years ago. I used the surname option. I was looking for Elijah. And actually, I, I thought Elijah was pretty solid, but I'm looking a little further. So with the surname option, I put in the surname Elifritz. And then I look to see what I get. And indeed, I found a number of people. I found six matches. That's the first bullet. Well, those people had posted their trees and I could see where they fit. And so, you know, since that time, because people add on and join the, uh, the ancestry group over time, I have found a lot of other good solid, 31 of them, Elijah people. But I wanted also to find Elijah's parents. And so again, I'm, I'm doing the same thing. I'm going to go for uh, the, uh, the surname option. I'll put in Ella Fritz. And then I look at postings that people had. So here, here is who uh, the blue arrow says, that's where Elijah is. I have some candidates out there of people who might be his parents because they were in the right place at the right time, but I don't have a birth record. And so I'm looking for scores of maybe, oh, about 14. So that's the kind of number I'm looking for for Elijah, because that's my third cousins. See, I'm looking for more like a score of 56 or something. Now, again, it's going to be good luck when you find those people who score higher than expected. So we're looking for fourth cousins. I put in the surname selection option and I get a bunch of hits. Here's a bunch of hits. And I put in also to see if they might have put in West Virginia. So, and indeed I, I got a number of hits. And uh, here, here's even more. But now look at the numbers. Now see this group, these are fifth to eighth cousins but then it says what their score is, 7.5, 7.4, 7.3. A lot of these people have low scores. And so, but with this option, ancestry reaches way down. Now, at least they used to reach down all the way to six. Now they only reach down to eight. So some of these people would no longer make the cut. But here's what I had. I first of all found 11 people who they had posted their trees and here were their scores. And notice they're all going back to that same couple that I told you that I had as candidates. But look at their scores. The highest one here is 22 and then the others 14, 8, 12, 12, nine, eight, seven, all those, some of which would no longer be in play. So with that new information, I re-upped my family tree and reposted it because I said, I believe in those, in that data, in those people. And now ancestry with through lines can help me and ancestry third bullet has now given me some 93 people who match Elijah's parents. And, and again, that does not even include the ones who didn't pose their tree. So now when you go back a generation, you're of course reaching into a, a, the potential of a lot more people. So sometimes you even find more fifth cousins than you did fourth cousins. So 
once I found the fourth cousins, that was the next step was to go ahead and find the fifth ones, fifth cousins. And again, I was successful. And again, look at those scores. There are, uh, how many were there? 26 matches, it says, underlined. So of those 26 matches, see, you can see the, the highest one scored 43 and then 32, 20, but all these others, in fact, as it says on the left-hand side there, the 15 lowest scores are all under 10. So, so we're, we're talking about a lot of low scores, which is what you expect if you're looking for fifth or sixth cousins. And so now through lines has also come through for me and they have found some 85 matches. So I'm just getting matches all over the place now. But again, notice the scores I've broken down of those 85 people, more of them, look at how many, 34 of them where the star is. That's really where we are with that. And then there will be an, a total other group of the people who did not post their data. And we can maybe find those if we can find that they have shared matches with a lot of the people that we already have in our cluster. And so that could work to our advantage as well. Now for the extra diligent researchers, if you're trying to find those fifth cousin people, you're going to have to, to reach down under 20 to find those scores. Um, uh, I just did a quick spot check and like among people who scored uh, below 12, uh, only a, a, a minority of them have shared matches. And so, but those are the ones that you want to find. And I guess as a full disclosure, I'd say it is true that a lot of those low scorers will not help us if they didn't post their tree. And if they don't have any shared matches, you really can't do, do much with them at that point. And, you know, we can try to email them, but sometimes that doesn't help either. So in point of fact, I think probably over half of them, maybe as many as 75% wouldn't do us too much good. But the ones that do us good, that's really a great thing. And on the good side, we might have some low scores that really pay off for us. You know, like here's a guy who only scored 7.5, but he had 33 shared matches with all those other people he's scoring over 20. And so he is certainly a solid match. And I have other examples of the same thing that happened. We're gonna wrap this one up. The fact is that for people who score under 20, all the way down to the cutoff, we need those people to extend our trees because that's where we're going to find most of the good scores for our fifth, sixth, seventh cousins. And well, that just says it again. And you probably can't even find those cousins without, without those low scoring matches. But the positive side of the story is that you can find them eventually Maybe you find them through the through lines feature, maybe some other way. And we have indeed come to the end. And I see that most of us who started, we're still right here. I'll say I'll push the button and we'll look at one another and talk.
there's a picture of my friend Anna. Anna, are you with us again? Yes. Um, can you hear me okay? I think we're just about on time. Yep. Um, if anybody has any questions, um, please do so now in the Q&A or chat. Um, right now we have um, another webinar group that they're having a webinar on December 5th. So if you're interested in that, go to that. Um, it looks like no one has any questions. So I'm going to share my screen. Oh, I jumped the gun. There's a new message. Oh, um, one person said, I wish Ancestry would take more interest in helping those of us trying to find ancestors farther back. I, I feel that frustration. Uh, well, I guess that's one of my messages. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad to get some other people who think the same thing. And we have someone that says thank you. Um, <laughs> they said they wish that they knew how to uh, to ask an intelligent thank you question. All for watching. We'll do it another time. Yep. Okay, so I'll share my screen. And okay, that is the right. So thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you will join us for our next webinar. Um, which will be on the 17th Irish Family History Research, The Essentials with Maureen Brady. Um, and a recording of this webinar will be made available next week. You can view that on our YouTube channel or our website. If you have any comments or questions, you can always email us at fhl underscore webinars at byu.edu or follow Facebook and Twitter. Thank you and have a wonderful week. And thank you, James. That was a wonderful webinar. Thank you.